Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this week's edition of the Young Bucks Podcast, your Pittsburgh Pirates Prospects Podcast of Choice. He's Corey Geiger. I'm Jerry Pudar. Corey, it is draft season. The MLB draft is going on right now. The first 10 rounds are done. And, you know, there are two players that you can pick. There's actually three, right? So you can pick the high school prospect, you know, the, the top guy out of high school. Or, or you can pick a guy that's, you know, on the fun fence between high school and college. Then you have the Juco guy that has been drafted quite some time. They go to the community college. Maybe they weren't cut out for, for a four-year school. Um, or it was just a better opportunity. And you can take them, too. Or you can go with a straight-up college guy. And, you know, it presents so many different options because they're so different. When you when you really sit back and look at the type of player that you get um, in the draft, and I guess Jared, it all comes down to uh, how quickly you want these guys to move. That kind of thing. Uh, we can sit here and tell you, and we will. I'll tell you what I prefer here in a second. Um, but there's not. It's hard to find hard data one way or another. Uh, first, second, third round picks or high round draft picks. If it's better to go the high school route or better to go uh, the college guy route, because some high school guys will become superstars. Some high school guys will fail miserably. Some college guys will become superstars. Some college guys will fail miserably. And so to, to truly see, you know, over, over a long, long period of time, it's hard to know which is the right way to go. Um, I prefer personally the college route i'll i'll share exactly why here in a minute but you see what i'm getting at jared is if if you need somebody if you think you can get somebody up there within the next two or three years certainly you go the college route if you're willing to wait four or five years then you go the high school route yeah and i think that's the thing that you know we've we've talked about before in the nba and the nfl more often than not if you're drafted top five you, you're going to be an impact player right away mm-hmm. in baseball. That's four or five years down the line. Now you see it in the pirates organization with Henry Davis, Henry Davis played college. So he's moved up the ladder pretty quickly. albeit he can't stay healthy, but he's in Altoona already. You know, he was drafted at this point last year as a number one pick. Now, of course, number one pick, take a guy for Bubba Chan, take a guy like Bubba Chandler, who we'll talk to here in the second segment um, on the young bucks podcast. He's a college guy or a high school guy, then gets drafted as a two way player. And he just now, uh, only a few weeks ago, got out of the Florida Complex League, which is below A ball. So, you know, there are just so many different options. So, for me, you know, I'm going to go against you here, Corey, just because I think it's more fun that way. I like the high school guy because they are number one, they're not necessarily as physically mature. Um, which is both a be- blessing and a curse. So you can tell what was projectable on their frame um, and, and how they're going to grow and develop, but also you can get them to buy into your, to what you're trying to teach hitting wise, pitching wise, fielding wise, whatever, and not have to go with those four years of reps at the collegiate level uh, to make sure that, that they're doing it the right way in the right way all the time. It's a good point. By the way, we should mention the <laughs> Pirates fans know this. They drafted, a middle infielder, a shortstop, Tamar Johnson, with the number four pick. He was rated the number four prospect. Now, I guess he wants to play shortstop. They they think he can be the shortstop. Everything I've seen from him is maybe his projection as a second baseman. Great hitter. Uh, but, he, again, he's a high school guy. So, look, um, they drafted Cole Tucker out of high school. He did not work out. They drafted Kevin Newman out of college you can really make kind of the case that he has not worked out. Although Kevin is still playing in the big leagues. He is, he has not reached his potential. He has not lived up to the hype yet uh, of what you would have thought a college guy would be. And then, you know, we can probably come up with 10 different um, examples of a high school guy who did work out and then 10 different examples of a college guy who worked out or did not, or what have you, I guess for me, the concern is, and, and I, I think Jared would probably be a good guy to hear your perspective on this 
you coach high school kids. You coach high school baseball. So I'm curious to hear what you have to say about this. My feeling on it is that the competition level that a high school prospect, even the highest level high school prospect who is on all of these travel teams, all these youth team USA. I mean, even a guy that has, has gotten every opportunity. My feeling, Jared, is it is so much projection because you are a billion years removed high school to major league baseball. To me, you take a college guy, there's less guesswork, there's less projection. Maybe the upside and the and the high ceiling is not there as much with the college guy. But do you think that I'm wrong when I say that, man, even the highest of the high high school draft picks, Jared, they're playing against god-awful competition a good bit of the time. You know, maybe they're playing against great competitions a good bit of the time, some of the time too. But how do you truly gauge a high school kid that might be playing really weak competition a lot of the time? Well, I think you're just looking at a bunch of different aspects. You know, I don't think that you're looking at who they're playing. I think they're, you're looking about how they go about things. I mean, a lot of. Why? Why, though? Why, why every sport we look at how they play? I'm not saying you're wrong, but why would that be going about your business? At some point, you still have to hit a 97 mile an hour fastball. If you've seen it a lot in college versus high school, you see what I'm getting at. Right. And, and, and as I was saying, you know, when you're looking at, when you're evaluating high school players, there's so much more because I think a lot of times, you know, the evaluation process is done, not necessarily in games, uh, but in the bullpen in in batting practice in BP or in infield outfield, you know, you see the movements, you see those sorts of things because you could go watch a game and you could watch a center fielder, not get a fly ball. You could go and watch a game and see a pitcher not pitch or, or this, that, and the other thing. So, you know, baseball is one of those unique sports where you have to see them do stuff. A lot of their work before the games to see their speed, their 60 time, their bat speed, you know, that's always going to play no matter how bad the competition is. Uh, pitchers, pitchers are always going to work, you know, and see what their movement is not, and regardless of who's, you know, who's hitting them. So, you know, the evaluation process for baseball players, I think, is a lot different than what it would be for a football player. I mean, you're not going to go out and watch Saquon Barkley do drills um, and skills, whereas baseball, you know, you have to go out and you have to perform each and every day. But a lot of the va- that evaluation process is done in practice because baseball is so unpredictable as a game that you never know when the ball is going to be hit or, or thrown your way. Yeah, I, I, I value everything that you said there. Because baseball has become this analytical thing where we try to project based on your fastball, how hard you throw, your times, and all this kind of stuff. For me, maybe this is the old man in me. I think you have to fail. I think you have to fail at a really high rate so that I know how you fail. And to me, if I'm taking a high school kid, I think the risk, again, I can't necessarily back this up with data. If somebody can find data that proves me to be a thousand percent wrong, go ahead. But I don't necessarily feel comfortable drafting some kid who hit 580 in high school and who thinks that, when you get out one time, your day is ruined or, or that, or something like that. And I guess that's what I'm getting at, Jared, the higher up you get, the more realistic the numbers are in, in, in baseball. If you're drafting a college guy, he understands that, Hey, if you hit 350 and 360 in college, that's phenomenal still. And he understands what it's like to get out 65% of the time. To me, I just, I, I truly wonder how much teams consider what I'm talking about of the mental makeup of what it's like when a kid fails and how that impacts his projectability. 
Well, I think it's not even just how they fail. I mean, obviously that matters, right? You want people to fail. And I think, you know, in, in all the talks that I've had with conversations throughout with, with baseball coaches throughout the country at the collegiate level, at the high school level, whatever, you know, they want to see how people react to adversity. That's life. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes baseball so special, right? You know, you fail 70% of the time and not and in high school. Yes. Not in high school, you don't. And, that, and that's what I'm getting. In high school, if you're hitting 600, are you really facing adversity? No. And, and you know, and every, your adversity is different than what it would be if you're in the, if the minor leagues. But you're looking, I think, a lot of mental makeup, not just as, as the failure, but as maturity, because you're not physically mature. But you're also, you know, you're 18, 19 years old. You have, you know this boyish thing, you still have the, that boyish mentality, that childish mentality to an extent. And then you go from high school to a professional athlete. And that's a world of difference. The game isn't different, but the atmosphere in which you're learning and, and being taught the game is completely different than what it is in high school. And I think once you get out of that high school mindset where you have to, you, you know, you're going to dominate in high school, you know, when you go out to the plate, Okay, I got this pitcher's number. I've got this hitter's number. But when you get to the minor leagues and people are throwing, you know, 95, 98, 99 miles per hour, and you have to be able to adjust on the fly, you can't rely on athleticism anymore. That's when skill takes over. And I think that's what you have to realize. And that's what scouts are evaluating whenever they're looking at high school athletes. Because, again, even the college athletes, you know, they're not uh, they're not a, a home run, so to speak. Mm -hmm. you know, that's right. And, and the same, and definitely same can be said from high school prospects, uh, because, you know, you look at high school guys like Neil Walker, Andrew McCutcheon, they were successful guys like whole Tucker, Kevin Newman, you know, obviously Newman was a, was a college guy and Tucker was high school, but you know, it, it, anything is possible in the game of baseball. It's just, you know, every, and that's why there's so many different levels. It, it weeds everybody out. The best of the best are playing in the major leagues and, and some are in high school and some, some didn't, you know, they just went straight there and and it's it's crazy to, to see it all play out. Yeah. And look, we, we have to we have to have this part of the discussion of, you know, the Pirates drafted a, an elite college hitter last year in Henry Davis. This year, they're taking an elite high school hitter in Tamar Johnson. And so, look, sometimes it's just, hey, you're going to get the take the best player you can and your philosophy you might have an overarching philosophy, but it might be, you might be flexible with it depending on individuals and, and, and so on and so forth. So that's it. Look, there's no right or wrong answer here. You mentioned Andrew McCutcheon. He succeeded as a high school guy. Cole Tucker didn't. Garrett Cole succeeded as a college guy. I mean, I think you have to say this, this is certainly debatable. I think you have to say Pedro Alvarez succeeded as a college guy. no, he didn't succeed for a tremendously long period of time, but Pedro was a, a pretty powerful slugger for several years. Hit what the thirty six homers the one year, and yeah, he he ended up being a disappointment. So uh, I don't take what I'm saying as gospel. But he was a college guy, and, and Neil Walker was a high school guy. Kevin Newman was a college guy. There, there, it does go back and forth depending on individual players. I guess for me personally, I know how difficult minor league baseball is. I know how difficult it is to work your way up the ladder in minor league baseball. I just think that the more prepared you are, the higher you are when you come into the minor leagues, meaning you probably came out of college. I, 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 I would feel more comfortable with that kind of guy as opposed to bringing in an 18 year old high school kid that man, he's got four years of grinding before he has really any prayer of getting to the big leagues. Right. And, you know, that's something that, that I talked about with Bob Chandler in, in our interview um, uh, for the Young Bucks podcast and for the feature that I wrote uh, for the for DK Pittsburgh Sports this week. You know, last year he was an 18 year old. He just graduated high school. He was at camp for for football, has to make that decision. You know, baseball is, is so unique because you you go from the top of the top, right? You're the top, your high level prospect. Um, in high school, and then you are, whoosh, you're, you're right. You're at the complex league, and the complex league is as low as it gets, you know, as far as developmental leagues. And, and I think it's a great – I think it's a great thing. I think that's 
honestly so much better than a rookie league and, and, and the way that that was shaped before Major League Baseball took over um, the minor league baseball system. But then you have to work your way up and up through. And, you know, in football and basketball, you know, you start as, a, as a, maybe a walk on or, or you start as a five star guy and, and you got to earn your keep and you got to earn your playing time. Well, here you got to earn it to advance, you know, in those other sports, you have to earn it to start and to to perform here. You have to perform uh, and, and get those opportunities so that you can move up the ladder. And it's not easy to do that. You know, every every level, you know, gets better. You know, and, and we talk about double A all the time and we're going to use that because we're both in Altoona. Well, that's where the throwers become pitchers and in Greensboro and in, in Bradenton and you know, even in the complex league, those guys are throwing 100 and they have no idea where it's going. But now, you know, guys are throwing 100 and 101 or 98, 97, and then they're coming with a power slider and they know what you're thinking, you know, when you're down 1 2 in the count or up 3 0 or up 2 1 or and all the different situations, you know, that that plague pitchers and, and hitters. And, and now it's a thinking man's game again. You're not just reacting on athleticism, you have to be a student of the game. You have to understand the situations and and go from there. And you know what, Jared, the bottom line with all of this is it is a giant crap shoot. The draft in any professional sport, football, basketball, uh, there are guys that miss badly in baseball because it's the hardest game in the world. You know, we were just talking, I think, last week on the podcast, the 2001 draft. If you go through the first round of the 2001 draft, it's god awful. Well, these teams are all spending all kinds of money. They're doing all their homework. They've got their scouts. And we can, you know, go round and round and back and forth on every guy and and tendencies and all that kind of stuff. But the bottom line is baseball will chew you up and spit you out. I'll come back to Cole Tucker one more time one of the greatest guys you'll ever meet, one of the coolest dudes in the world. You root for him and you root for him and you root for him, but he's just not very good. And uh, and that's what baseball will do to you. And, you know, you can root for a guy like Cole Tucker. You can root for Tamar Johnson. Maybe he becomes the face of the franchise someday. Maybe Henry Davis becomes the face of the Pirates someday. Um, but, boy, when, when you really think about um, – who 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 you're looking for that can be more of a surefire bet there there's there is none there there's just no tried and true formula because every single player in every single scenario is different right and i think that's the beauty of baseball because you know you can start as this again we we mention this on the we are podcast all the time but when you're a prospect your draft pick and I think people get attached to this draft to the to where people are drafted all the time. I mean, you look at Tony Sanchez and Reese McGuire, both high level draft picks by the Pirates, and they just whiffed on them. And you know, and Reese McGuire ended up carving out uh, a pretty decent major league career um, when he wasn't in parking lots. So that's always a plus. But you know, you look at that evaluation process, and and again, like you said, it's a crapshoot. So, you know, you can have all this data, but at the end of the day, they got out, they got to go out and play the game. And I think that's what makes baseball so special is you still got to perform. You can have all the data in the world, but feel and performance matter more than any evaluation tool out there. But without further ado, I mentioned Bubba Chandler joins us for the second segment. Let's go ahead and get to that. And then we're going to catch you on the flip side of, of our interview with Bubba Chandler here on the Young Bucks podcast on the DK Pittsburgh Sports Podcasting Network. Welcome back to the Young Bucks podcast. I'm joined by a uh, familiar name, uh, if you're if you're a Prospects fan, uh, Bubba Chandler, pitcher, um, all-around player for, for the Bradenton Marauders. So, Bubba, thank you, as always, for joining us. Now that you've been in Bradenton uh, as a member of the Marauders, what's that experience been like for you? Well, um, 
the first two days couldn't have gone any better. Um, first day I was there, got to play, got a few hits, and we got a win. And then yesterday, um, we had a walk-off win. So um, really just a cool experience, first and foremost. And um, the team we have is, A, a really cool and fun team to be around, but also filled with guys that are going to play for many, many years. Now, you're a two-way player, and that's not – very common other than you see guys like Shohei Otani do that. And, and what goes into the preparation for that on a day-to-day basis? Because that's much different than if you were just a position player or just a pitcher. Um, really, it's just finding good routines, um, working out right, eating right, and finding a consistency between being a kid and then being a professional athlete. Um, and I finally found that. So, it's not as hard as some people make it out to be, um, but also, yeah, your body is your body is a little more tired than more people than most people's. But uh, once you find that good routine, I guess it is um, pretty much just kind of secondhand nature. Now, how do you find that routine? Because at this point last year, you're preparing for the draft. Now you're in low A. How do you find that routine and, and that balance? Because you're only what nineteen, correct? Yes, sir. So how do you find that balance between still being a young kid and being a professional athlete? Um, really just knowing your limits with some things. Uh, and, um, it took me, a, took me a, it took me almost a year to find out what some thing, what things I can and cannot do to be successful. Um, not only at pitching, but also at hitting and being able to survive a long season, like, minor leagues and major league baseball seasons are. And, um, yeah. Now, like I mentioned at this point last year, you're preparing for the MLB draft. You're um, dealing with, and I see you're wearing a Clemson hoodie. You're, you're a Clemson football player and you have to make that life-changing decision to whether you want to be a football player or you want to be a baseball player. What goes into a decision like that? Because that can't be easy. And now, obviously, with the way that things are with the NIL and, and things of that nature in collegiate athletics, how, did that play into, into, this, into this decision, or, or how did that go for you? Um, I mean, it was really just uh, – I thought of whenever I was a kid, whenever, like, the draft time was coming around, whenever I was a kid, what did I want to be when I grew up? And that was – I wanted to be Trevor Jones when I grew up, really. So, and Chipper Jones was a professional baseball player. And so I really just talked to God and uh, listened to my heart. And they both said, hey, go give, go give minor league baseball a try. And that's what I'm doing. And I don't regret anything. Um, Clemson, Clemson's the best. I still stay in contact with a lot of the coaches, all the players. So it's a, it's a family there, but it's also a family here. Pittsburgh and, the, and this organization. So can't be thankful. Uh, was that a tough conversation to have with, with Dabo and some of the other coaches on the staff there, or was that kind of easy? Like you were like, I know this is what I want to do. This is what, what God in, in my life and the people in my life are telling me, or how does that conversation go with, with a guy like Dabo? Um, it was pretty easy. I was at peace with what I wanted to do and my decision. Um, and Dabo knew, uh, that where my heart was and like same thing he told me was just trusting God and he's going to lead the right, right way for you. So it wasn't that hard. Um, he doesn't know it, but it was kind of emotional for me um, because I was up there for close to a month. And um, so I got to, in that short time period, I got to meet guys and be friends with guys. I'll be friends with the rest of my life and guys who are going to play in the NFL and do great things in this world. And, um, so that was hard, uh, leaving a game that I've played my whole life, um, really just cold turkey and not not really having those experiences to play in college and on the NFL. But I was I was more at peace than I thought I would have been. And Dabo and Brandon Streeter, their quarterback's coach, now offensive coordinator, they understood. Um, they understood everything that I wanted to do, and they were very loving and caring about and respecting my decision. And they always said, hey, there's always a, a open locker for you if you ever want to come back. And there will always be tickets waiting for you at the gate if you ever want to come to the game. So, now, do you plan on going to a game this fall? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I didn't go any – I didn't go to any uh, last year. Um, really just 
I live in Athens, Georgia, where the University okay. of Georgia is. So if I ever did go to football games, I just went to UGA ones. But um, really just got caught up in the – it's my it's my first off season, so let's start to, like, grind and really get, get locked in mentally and physically. But, uh, yeah, next year, this upcoming year, I'll definitely be at pretty much probably every home game. So. You've been a multi-sport athlete nearly your entire life. How big of a difference was it to go from – you know, an off season that you spend maybe for baseball, you're playing football and for football, you're playing baseball or any other sports. So how difficult was it to just focus on that one sport for the first time in your life? Um, it was weird. Um, usually growing up, I was always pulled in many directions saying, all right, I, I got football practice this morning. And then this afternoon I have a baseball game. So um, that was kind of a burden off my shoulders uh, that I just, I could relax and take take time that I needed to recover and all that stuff. All that good, those good things. Was there a sense of kind of calm and relief when things like that happen? Because you're now you're not being pulled in a million different avenues. Now you can just solely focus on on one thing. Well, I guess multiple things, but one sport um, in general. Yeah, um, I believe just focusing on one sport, I can fully tap into the potential I could have um, with it. So that's one thing I'm excited to be or excited to do really is see where just focusing and locking in on baseball, where that could take me and how good or how bad I could get. But, um, yeah. Has your professional baseball career met your expectations? Like what were you expecting coming into it once you were drafted by the pirates and made your decision compared to where you're at now? Has it met those decisions or met that? those expectations or, or what have you expected and, and what have you kind of grown as, uh, as a professional baseball player? Uh, yeah. I mean, coming in, every expectation I had has pretty much been met. Um, heard it's always been a grind and, uh, it is a grind, but it's, it's the, it's a fun one for sure. Being around, being around guys who are your age, close to your age, um, really just form a brotherhood like you do with any team. But, um, when you're with guys every single day, morning to evening to night, um, you start to get close to dudes, and that's one thing I love about it. But, yeah, I mean, everything I thought about pro ball coming in has pretty much came true, and I, I'm pretty stoked about it. So before I let you off the hook and, and go prepare for your for your first start uh, of, of low A with Bradenton, tell, tell our listeners really what – Bubba Chandler is about who Bubba Chandler is. Cause I don't think that we've really gotten a good grasp of you just yet, because it, obviously you're only a year in uh, to your career. So tell it, let's talk to our listeners about, you know, who you are as a person and, and what makes Bubba Bubba. Um, no, well, what makes Bubba Bubba is he's a, uh, he listens to God. He listens to his family and friends that he's close with and just lets them lead him in the right direction and then listens to his heart. Uh, love to have fun. Um, just if I'm not smiling on a baseball field, if I'm not smiling in general, whenever you see me, just know something's wrong. So just try to be the most fun, charismatic guy out there. And, uh, yeah, it's me. Very good. Bubba, thank you as always for joining the, the Young Bucks podcast and DK Pittsburgh Sports Podcast in Africa. And best of luck the rest of the season. I appreciate it, man. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Young Bucks podcast. We'd like to thank Bubba Chandler for joining us as always. Luckily, he's down in Bradenton, you know, and enjoying the break right now. But Corey, he's a pitcher and a hitter. Not very many people can do that, but man, is it fun to watch Shohei Otani do that every day? I'll tell you, it's unbelievable what, what Otani's doing. There have been so few guys that have been able to do, uh, to try to even try both. I was a Chicago Cubs fan 30 years ago. They had a guy named Brooks Kieschnick. He actually hit and pitched in the big, it's so rare to do it. So we thought we would have some fun with this of, 
of which one would you rather do? I wrote about this about Bubba a few weeks ago. Would, would you rather be a pitcher or a position player? If, if you had your choice um, to go into, go into professional baseball and you can either be a pitcher or a position player, there's two ways to look at this. One, there's the what's more fun, but two, where's the money coming from? And they are kind of different, Jared. So I'll let you go first. What would you rather do, be a pitcher or a position player? Uh, well, I sit here knowing that I have an, a doctor's appointment coming up to determine when I have to get shoulder surgery after pitching for th- 25 years um, of my life. But I would still be a pitcher, man. I would, I'm left-handed. I mean, I've seen guys like Oliver Perez and Chris, and um, and guys like that and Zach Duke and, you know, those old school pirates that are still in the league for some ungodly reason because they are able to throw with the wrong hand. Um, but I would be a pitcher, and I would love it because, you know, you are in control every time. The hitter is not in control. They ha- Hitting is reactionary. Fielding is reactionary. But being a pitcher and – you know, it, you ha- you're in control every pitch. It, it, it's there at your peril. You have to throw a strike. You have to, you know, let your defense do the work. And I think that's what makes it so unique. But also, that's where the money's at, man. If you're good enough, you're going to have a job. And especially at left, at being left-handed, man, I'd have some serious job security if I were able to throw strikes. You know, you mentioned Oliver Perez. He's 63 years old. And he's still pitching in Major League Baseball. I'm just kidding. He's only 41. It feels like he's 63. One of the things I think that I hope the listeners pick up on this stuff. uh, Jared and I disagree about a lot of stuff on our podcast. And I think it's good. We had a great discussion the other day on our We Are podcast about college football, about whether you'd rather walk on at a major college program or go get a scholarship at a smaller college program where you'll get to play a lot. I mentioned that, Jared, because I'm going to go with the exact same philosophy. I want to play. All right. You're right. Pitchers have more control. You're right. Pitchers can play a long time. And if you're good at doing one or two things, if you can throw one or two pitches, you can make millions. But my God, man, to me, life as a pitcher would suck. Now I'm talking about a starting pitcher. I'm not talking about a reliever. Relievers are different. If there's a chance, I I want a chance to play every single day when I go to the ballpark. And generally speaking, relief pitchers kind of have that. They're going to play four times a week, maybe maybe five. But, Jared, I I could not for the life of me be excited about pitching one day a week and then busting my ass doing all this other stuff for four other days – to prepare for that one day. And then I finally get to play for one day. And if I struggle, I get pulled in the first inning after 30 pitches. I I just, man, I give me a chance to play the field, to take grounders, to, to hit three or four times every day. I would take that in a heartbeat over being a pitcher. No chance. I'm stepping in against 95 or 98 with movement. No chance. So I don't want to hit. I'd rather pitch. I'd rather do that. And, you know, I think the the in between the starts with the starting pitchers, I think that's, you know, there's so much more than meets the eye than, than, you know, the on the field workouts or whatever you're watching film, you're working on mechanics. You're always learning. And, you know, when you, obviously when you throw like they do on, on a given day, clearly. (laughs) Hang on. I'm yawning. I'm I'm going to sleep here. And you talk about all that shit because that doesn't seem interesting to me in the least. (laughs) Right. So, you know, everybody is entitled to their opinions and some people want to be able to blow it past you and some people want to hit it right back at you. And it's just kind of kind of what you want to do. But if you, you know, if like like what um, Bubba Chandler said, you know, you got to have that right routine and and what works for you. And when you find that, whether you're a pitcher, whether you're a hitter, you're in good shape. Yeah, but here's the problem. OK, Bubba Chandler's got to choose. Uh, everybody has to choose. You know why? Because the baseball is so hard. So I I am in, intrigued very much so by Bubba Chandler. Any Pirates fan should be intrigued in the era of Shohei Otani. He ain't going to be a star in both. It's 99.9999999999% chance he ain't going to be able to do both at a high level at the big leagues because it's too hard. And what happens is 
once you start to struggle even a little bit in one of the areas, they will use it against you and they will blame the fact that you're doing too much and they will force you into one way. If you can continue to be a star like Bubba Complex was in the Florida Complex League, that's fine. But at some point as a hitter, you're going to go one for 30. Or at some point as a pitcher, you're going to give up 15 earned runs in four innings. And at that point, and until a guy gets to one of those points in a professional organization, and the team has to say, okay, we're not going to ruin you in both aspects. We're going to make you choose. And ultimately, that that's what's going to happen with Bubba Chandler. The only player we've seen in the last hundred years that it didn't happen to just so happens to be some super superstar, superhero, non-human kind of guy in Shohei Otani. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out because, you know, um, it, when you look at guys like that and you look at Bubba Chandler and you look at – we talk about routines – and, and getting into those routines because he he hits he hits four days a week and the other days are, are spent focusing on, on the pitching aspect of it. Um, but he's also a switch hitter and that can't that doesn't make things any easier because you got to see the ball from both sides of the plate. And obviously, you know, he's probably going to see you know the left side a little bit more because they're more frequently going to be right-handed hitter. So, you know, you got to be able to protect yourself uh, in certain situations, but it'll be interesting to see how the pirates continue to let him develop. Um, and, and if he can handle it, because, you know, obviously he just jumped up to the, uh, to Bradenton and, and things are going okay. They're not ideal. And, you know, he had his first start uh, over the uh, weekend and, you know, he gave up four runs in two and two thirds innings and a uh, two run homer in the first inning. And, and mm-hmm. he's still building himself up. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see how the rest of the season plays out for him. OK, now so that he's ask- finally playing uh, recognized ball. It is. It does seem to be the consensus that he has a higher upside as a pitcher. Is that correct? What, can we all agree on that, Jared? Yes. If his pitching struggles, they're going to do away with the hitting. I guarantee you. Because if if everybody is in agreement that he has a chance to be a really special hitter, they're not going to F around if his pitching struggles. You see what I'm saying? As long as he's pitching fine, as long as he's pitching fine, and the offense can be seen as something that he's doing separate and extra. Let's see. And it's, it's such a small sample size. He's played. He's had 10 at bats. He's bad 222 so far. For Bradenton. Again, that's that's such a small number. But as long as he's pitching okay, the Pirates can say, hey, let's let's let him keep doing the hitting thing. Once his pitching really drops off, if it ever does, that to me is when the hitting thing is done. Because the Pirates, they know that as well that his higher upside is probably as a pitcher as well. Right. So, you know, once that decision's made, it'll be interesting to see how that all plays out because you know it does matter. And we are still years away from I think that happening. But Nah, you you think he's hitting and pitching when he gets the Altoona curve? I think so. No way. Let's have a nice little wager on that. I think you already owe me a dinner. There is no way he is hitting and pitching on any level of consistent basis in double A. I I I have I cannot see it. I we're gonna I'm gonna bet you a sheets meal. How about that, Jared? We're in Altoona. We're gonna bet a sheets dinner that uh, Bubba Chandler ain't pitching and hitting both when he gets the Altoona curve. And let's say, let's see, he's in Bradenton now. So I'm going to say probably early 2024 would be when he would get here. Is that about the right time frame? Yeah, I would imagine it depends on kind of how the rest of the season goes, whether he gets called up to Greensboro. But I think, you know, late uh, 2023, early 2024, I think is a, is a good estimate of when he'll end up in Altoona. And what but, sucks for him really is they don't, First of all, uh, they guys don't hit in the minor leagues anymore. Uh, in Double A, pitchers used to hit until just a, a handful of years ago, and now it's all DH all the time. So again, that that's going to work against him as well. The higher up he gets in the minor leagues, yeah. So it'll be like I said. I think it'll be interesting to see how this uh, projects for Bubba Chandler, and it'll be interesting to see how he can name, how he can handle both sides um, of the field and. And seeing how how that goes throughout the rest of the system. Well, if I can, I want to make before we get off here. I want to make one more comparison of, of the kind of philosophy that I was just talking about, and I want to bring it back to the O'Neill Cruz shortstop thing. 
O'Neill Cruz had the fastest recorded throw in the StatCast era the other day from shortstop. Uh, my all-time favorite player is Sean Dunstan. I'd love to see O'Neill Cruz's arm against Sean Dunstan's from, from 30 years ago. Um, but these are the same reasons why I do not believe O'Neill Cruz will be an everyday shortstop in the big leagues because shortstop requires you to do have so much emphasis and focus on your defense at all times. And because it is such an incredibly difficult position, as long as O'Neill Cruz is hitting and doing everything he needs to do offensively, I think Jared, they're willing to let him stay at shortstop right now. He's hitting two Oh four. His OPS is six thirty eight. That ain't good enough. That ain't good enough. All right. And so to me, as, as electric as he is and as the high ceiling as he gets, you're just putting more pressure on him to play shortstop when basically if you threw him in right field, he could get a break in a lot of ways and and then get to focus more on his offense. So I, that, I just wanted to make that comparison a little bit because when you're, fo- when you're forced to do that much more on defense or something else and it's taking away from your primary – asset which O'Neill Cruz is his bat at some point the Pirates will look at this and say you know hey let's let's light let's lessen the burden on the kid let's put him in right field so he can just focus more on hitting right and obviously if you need to give him a day off you can always get put him at DH too so I mean there are options and there are even options for for you know when in the Pirates organization they love versatility so it's no shock that they're letting Bubba Chandler do what he's doing. It'll just be interesting to see how they continue to let him do that as he climbs through the system. Where are you on the O'Neill Cruz in three years? Is O'Neill Cruz an everyday shortstop? I st- I still think that he's going to be in the outfield. I think okay. that that I think that as as athletic as he is, I still think that Pigero projects better defensively. He's not, but again, you know, at a value position like shortstop, if you can hit. 250, 260 with 30 home runs and 30 stolen bases. That's not a can bad he? thing either. Can he do that at shortstop? I don't think he can. So that, that's the issue. Therein lies the issue. I don't think he can do that offensively, what you're talking about, and still be an elite level shortstop. I just don't think you can. Uh, I mean, the guys, it's so difficult to do. If he does it, then they'll let him play, stay at shortstop. If he's got a, an OPS under, 600, under 700, then they're going to have a hard time keeping him at shortstop. Right. And I think that's, again, we talked about this in the first segment. It's the beauty of baseball. You just don't know what's going to happen, how it's going to, how it's going to play out because, you know, right now it's the downhill part uh, or the uphill part for O'Neill Cruz. But when that down, when he gets going downhill and and things are working for him, man, is he electric to watch. And well, let me just mention this because Dayon Kovat DK mentions this a lot on Twitter, especially that the batting average doesn't matter as we sit here. O'Neill's hitting 204. That's not the issue. The issue is the 38 strikeouts and 104 plate appearances. Okay. Uh, again, it's a, he's young, but you can't be striking out 35% of the time. He does have the four home runs. The OPS is not good. The on-base percentage is 240. His on-base percentage is 240, Jared. And so as we look ahead at, you know, I know this is the Young Bucks podcast, but he is still a young buck and he's still got developing to do. And this is why me and some other people like me will continue to harp on not uh, not thinking that he's going to be a sh- because there are other reporters out there who see him play shortstop and they fall in love and they're hell bent on putting out all of this information about how O'Neill Cruz could be this sensational short. Maybe he could be, but it's not going to come at the expense of his offense. If his offense struggles, they just simply cannot keep him there. Right, and and that time is going to come sooner rather than later because there are guys. I think that are in the system that could probably play shortstop a little bit better. They might not be as athletic. But defensively, you know, you, defense wins championships, whether the Pirates are competing for one of those uh, in any time in the near future remains to be seen. I wouldn't necessarily hold my breath, but alas, that is always an option. But the good news for us is we haven't reached our ceilings yet, but we have reached the end of this podcast. So for Corey Geiger, I'm, this is Jared Prugar. We thank you as always for listening to the Young Bucks podcast on the DK Pittsburgh Sports Podcasting Network. <laughs>